I would like to introduce our multi-talented uh, moderator for this evening, terrific bowler at times, <laughs> most of the time. Uh, most recently, Monday. <laughs> that's right. We'll talk a little more about that. But uh, Michael has been uh, on faculty here at the uh, Los Angeles Center of Photography for, for many, many years. Um, um, his website, if you haven't had a chance to check that out, buildabetterphotograph.com. Um, a lot of Michael's uh, experience, uh, he's architectural product copy photographer, and then he got in the field of time-lapse photography. Um, and uh, from there, uh, went on to pivot uh, construction documentation. He works with some of the largest builders in America. Uh, so gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator this evening. Mr. Stern, the floor is yours, my friend. Well, thank you, Brandon. <clears throat> and thank you, Kevin. Glad to be here. Welcome, everybody. Marcy, thank you so much for doing this. And we'll get things started. I have a brief bio to read uh, about Marcy. Uh, Marcy Palmer's work centers on themes of beauty, nature, and science. She has an MFA in photography and related media from the School of Visual Arts and a BS in studio art from Skidmore College. Raised in upstate New York, she currently lives in Dallas with her husband, Thad a native Texan, son Cy, and their dog Freckles. And she can often be found outside collecting botanicals on long walks with Freckles. I'm assuming sometimes Sad, Thad and Cy go with you, but uh, mostly Freckles. Uh, Marcy's work has been exhibited at various spaces, including the Griffin Museum of Photography, the Brooklyn Museum of Art, the Ogden Museum of Southern Art, and other venues. Her work has been written about in the Boston Globe Sunday edition, Humble Arts Foundation, Lens Scratch, to name a few. She released a book with Yoffe Press at the end of 2020 titled You Are Eternity, You Are the Mirror, which was chosen as a Photo Eye 2020 favorite photo book, The Loop's Best Women Made Photo Books of 2020, and is one of Deep Red Press's memorable books, photo books of 2020. And with that, I would like to introduce you to Marcy Palmer. Welcome, Marcy. <laughs> thank you all. Um, thank you, Michael, Brandon, and Kevin, and LACP for having me. And thank you all for being here. Um, I, I appreciate it. <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started. Um, so I have a quote here that I found inspiring and um, I wanted to share it with you. Um, and it's, uh, since past photographs inform future photographs, looking at photographs and other visual material should be a primary activity. Look at what drives your visual curiosity. Look at the classics. They have been preserved because their artistic, conceptual, and technical content serves as a model that has proved useful over time. Look at contemporary work that is grappling with new and different ways of expressing ideas. Read, study, and practice different methods of photography, not for the sake of technique, but to discover the means to articulate your ideas. Don't make technical learning your priority, form an idea first. The German artist Joseph Beuys said it best, once you've got an idea, the rest is simple. So that's by Robert Hirsch from his book, Light and Lens. So, um, this, the overarching theme I'm talking about here is um, finding beauty in nature or tranquility in nature. And I'm just gonna touch on a little bit of art history or others from the past that have worked with these ideas. So um, I'm going with this image here, I'm going back to the romantic period in art in the late 1700s. And this is Lake Scene Evening by Philip James de Lutherburg. And um, this painting adheres to the idea of the picturesque, uh, which was an aesthetic formula for the ideal landscape based on various visual effects in order to give the landscape, um, it gives order to the landscape, making sure everything, including the humans, were in its proper place. Uh, the combination of various levels of ground, textures, including rocks, water, and clouds adhere to this formula as well. So you can see here, there's people in the landscape, but there's all kinds of other heights and textures and things happening. So um, the picturesque also referred to as the charm of discovering landscape in its natural state. 
And the goal was to find solace in nature and discover beauty created only by nature. The unspoiled panoramas are uplifting, not frightening. And this follows the picturesque aesthetic, excuse me, um, with the panoramic view, varying heights, textures, and peaceful setting. So here's just another, another one here. So scientists have posed the question, um, is this type of landscape of comfort to us because it's in our DNA? Dr. Gordon Orients has spent time trying to answer this question through his research and found that people often like artworks that depict a safe habitat evoking the landscape where humans once evolved. Um, this image by Thomas Cole in the Hudson River School is still using the picturesque devices to evoke a feeling of peacefulness and union with the landscape. So seeking solace in these landscapes. Jumping ahead a bit here. Um, biologists believe that ancient history, the rise and fall of different body types, survival strategies, and instincts for habitat has a way of shaping the DNA where it becomes a sort of ghostly puppeteer. In humans, the strings tying us to our past may stretch back more than 2 million years. And these strings take the form of innate propensities, things we do unthinkingly and without having to learn from our parents. Um, this is from an article, The Natural History of Art by Richard Conniff in Discover Magazine. So related to the idea that we enjoy botanicals because innately they represent fruit, honey, food, and fragrance, um, they also represent the possibility of enjoyment because of all those things. And there's this idea that it's likely part of our DNA. It's, it's inherent to us. Um, and it may be why we bring flowers to someone to make them feel better. Um, they remind us of better times. So I just showed a few slides of Weston's work. He was part of this F64 movement of photographers and um, they believe that detail in an image will depict emotion and connection with the subject. They're also very interested in um, evoking a sense of wonder uh, within their images. Um, and this is by Imogen Cunningham, who is also part of F64 and uh, she works with symmetry, line, shape, and contrast, creating beauty in the composition as well as the natural subject matter. And you can see that here as well. It's from 1928. And I have a quote by her as well. So she says, my interest in photography has something to do with the aesthetic and that there should be a little beauty in everything. Uh, and I love that. Okay, so sort of moving on to the project that I've been working on, uh, Your Eternity. So this is an exploration of beauty as an antidote for personal and political crisis. In times of trouble, many turn to beauty in the natural world as a place of refuge. Beauty and refuge can exist in multifaceted ways for different people, and part of what I'm considering with this project is how the transcendent aspect of beauty can be experienced and that it ultimately resides within oneself. This series began in 2018 as I was taking walks along a nature trail near my home to find respite, which has become a popular activity since the pandemic. Um, I'd been walking the trail for several years and in an earlier series collected natural objects. Uh, for this series, I began collecting botanicals. So in my mind's eye, I imagined these as gilded photographs and decided to learn the process to make what I imagined or what I could see in my head. I wanna recognize that beauty as a subject matter is a bit of a taboo in contemporary times. Um, and uh, this idea uh, is, is sort of rebelling against many contemporary themes. So in um, the Tate Museum's uh, magazine, Tate, et cetera, issue 34 from 2016, JJ Charlesworth states, the idea of beauty was always about how much human beings valued their own humanity. 
about how beauty stood in for the optimism that everything could eventually be beautiful or good. But since we see hum the human world as an ugly place, beauty no longer matters in art. It should, but it doesn't. I disagree in that it doesn't. I think it does, especially in times like this and especially as a place of respite. So um, I, I think that we need beauty in the sense of accessing a higher self. So um, my images are influenced by botanical studies by Anna Atkins as she isolated her subject um, from its natural background. And she also lyrically placed her subject in the composition. And I'm kind of referencing that through these. Um, for those who are not familiar with Atkins work, it was done in the mid 1800s for a scientific study of botany. Um, however, it's considered artistic and she used an early form of photography to make these images. They're direct contact prints using the cyanotype process. Um, you can see that areas of white are where the light didn't pass through the plant materials that were placed on the photosensitive paper and areas of light blue or blue are where the light did pass through. Atkins worked on these for several years with Sir John Herschel to produce books of images. And as I said, they were a scientific um, investigation of, of botany and of plants. Uh, my work also references botanical illustration from 100 to 100 years ago. And I like that my images look like they could be from another time. So this is mine here. And another one. I use a 24 karat and 18 karat gold leaf in the process, uh, which accounts for some of the color differences that you see. Uh, some are lighter, sort of a lighter yellow, more and more this orangey gold. Um, And I often get questions about how these are made um, because they don't look like typical photographs. Uh, they're printed on vellum uh, with hand applied gold leaf varnish and wax. Uh, and you can see the vellum here. Um, I'll go through the process step by step. Um, so the botanical is photographed, uh, converted to black and white and sometimes manipulated digitally uh, and then printed on vellum. And the vellum is a semi-transparent paper. As you can see from the last si slide, my hand was sort of showing through the top right corner. Um, in the process, uh, the print is then flipped over. So this is the opposite of what you just saw. Uh, and the 18 or uh, 24 karat gold leaf is applied to the back of the print. Okay, so here's a little bit of the gold leaf. It's kind of in process. And this is the back of a gilded print. So basically what happens is the gold shines through the transparent vellum through the other side. And so this is, this is a final version of, of what you just saw. Um, a varnish is applied, and this is to protect the work from UV light, as well as other elements that could encounter it. Uh, a wax is also applied to bring out the tonal contrast in the work. Scale can vary from an image size of four by six inches uh, to 16 by 23 inches. And a lot can go wrong when applying the gold leaf. Um, it's a meticulous process and it can be heartbreaking and risky at a larger size. <laughs> I'm also influenced by surrealist photographers like Dora Maar and Maurice Tabard who use image manipulation techniques to make their images seem otherworldly. And so this is mine. And I have a few examples of Maurice Tabard's work. Um, these are experimentations in the 1930s with multiple exposures. 
solarization. Um, they did all kinds of experimental things at that time, which I find really interesting. Um, the manipulation of the image that they did was to make the viewer pause and question the image of its content and meaning. And that's um, something that I'm thinking about as well. So I've done my own experimentation and manipulation with the subject matter. As you can see here. And these are images by uh, Florence Henri, um, who's associated with surrealist and Bauhaus movements. Uh, she manipulated the viewer's perspective by using camera angle and mirrors. And her subjects are often of the natural world. So I'm showing you just a few here where she uses flowers. Um, the work is from the 1920s and 30s. And I love this one, in part because it's really, it's you connect what's on the right side with what's on the left, but when you look at it closely, you realize they really can't be connected in the way that you initially perceive it. And I think that's really interesting. Um, so, Uh, I've been interested in the manipulation of the image and of putting the subject in an otherworldly space by eliminating any concrete backgrounds. Uh, the subjects exist in an imagined space, and I've also manipulated the composition by implying movements in the frame, oftentimes where no movement has actually occurred. So, uh, why are flowers beautiful? Or more precisely, why are flowers beautiful to us? Uh, philosophers, scientists, and writers have tried to define the essence of beauty for thousands of years. The plurality of their efforts uh, illustrates the immense difficulty of this task. Beauty, they have said, is harmony, goodness, a manifestation of divine perfection, a type of pleasure, that which causes love and longing, longing and M equals O over C as an equation where M is the aesthetic value, O is order and C is complexity. And this is from the article, How Beauty is Making Scientists Rethink Evolution from January 2019, New York Times Magazine. So as I mentioned earlier, the project is an exploration of beauty as an antidote for personal and political crisis. In times of heartache, disaster, impasse, many turned to the idea of beauty in the natural world as a place of refuge. John O'Donohue has stated of beauty that it returns to us often in fleeting but sustaining moments to our highest selves. The project began by searching for and exploring this, the transcendent aspects of beauty and contemplating it as a necessary part of our lives. So images like this one, windblown wildflowers, are about the ethereal transcendent moments that we can experience. As well as this one, duo. And you can see more of, of what I've been talking about here. I have a few installation shots just so you can get an idea for scale and the range of scale. Um, so these are from a show at the Griffin Museum. Um, the, if these images here are with the 18 karat gold leaf and you can see it's sort of a lighter tone. And um, these are from, um, these have been shown in other spaces since then. Um, these are from Processing Narratives that was at the Colorado Photographic Arts Center. 
And you can see, you know, some of these are quite large and some are, are much smaller. So in many of the images, I use common, often overlooked wildflowers, and I'm interested in recognizing and elevating them by gilding them. So that's why I'm using the gold leaf. I think that this can be a metaphor for moments of beauty or transcendence in life, but also for people in political change. So as this project evol evolved, uh, the pandemic happened, there have been all kinds of um, things that have been happen happening politically and with people. And I've been thinking about that and kind of integrating it into the work. So this is Firestorm, Time for Change. And to me, this is more political in nature. Um, I wanted some of the images to reflect the current climate of ideas of pain that is intrinsically linked to hope and beauty. You know, there's, so there's two sides of this. I also see this one in particular as uh, about memory and change and touches on all of those ideas. And this one also relates as well. So in the book of these images, You Are Eternity, You Are the Mirror, uh, the images are paired with a poem on beauty by Khalil Gibran. And I'll read just a small part of the poem. Uh, it is not the image you would see, not the song you would hear, but rather an image you see, though you close your eyes, a song you hear, though you shut your ears. It is not the sap withing the furrowed bark, nor a wing attached to a claw, but rather a garden forever in bloom, a flock of angels forever in flight. People of Orpheles, beauty is life when life unveils her holy face, but you are life, and you are the veil. Beauty is eternity gazing at itself in the mirror, but you are eternity and you are the mirror. So um, I relate the Im these images to ideas of personal and political empowerment, as well as beauty. Um, these ways that our experiences of the world and beauty itself can be different and yet empower us. O'Donoghue has also stated, I think that beauty is not a luxury but that it ennobles the heart and reminds us of the infinity within us. And it's funny, I, I think I've been having conversations recently where people are talking about wanting a sense of respite, um, especially because of current times and, and what's happening. And so um, that's something that I'm really trying to explore with this project and um, I, I find important. <laughs> um, so this is PAL, this is on 18 karat gold leaf. Um, and these are you know, sort of a type of thistle that I had photographed and manipulated for this image. And there's, you know, if you look at these images carefully, a lot of times there's uh, more subtle impressions that might be in the background. Um, sometimes there's something right up front that you see right away, but then there's other things that are kind of happening that are a little more subtle behind them. So there's shapes in the background and various, various tones. Uh, 
and this is Twisted Stock. I found it important to show different parts of the plant as well. So I was trying to show the roots and some other aspects of it, not just the flowers that kind of stand out right away, but other, other things. And um, these plants are not always in the best condition <laughs> when they're photographed. And I sort of like that. I like that um, many of them are in various states of um, transformation. Uh, sometimes they're uh, past the point, you know, sort of the highest point of bloom. And I think that that's interesting. Um, so I'm finding that in other images as well. Uh, the, the Boston Globe reviewed the exhibition at the Griffin, and from that came an opportunity to publish a book of the images with Yaffe Press. As I mentioned earlier, we paired the images with a poem by Khalil Gibran. We use a gold colored metallic ink. And an unusual binding, so it's a it's considered um, a French fold by some, others refer to this as a Japanese fold. Basically, it's an accordion binding that's, that comes together uh, at the spine. And so you can kind of look through the inside of the pages uh, when you're looking at it from above or below. Uh, vellum is used in several places because that's the medium that was used in the prints. And here you can see the effect of the French fold binding. So the backs of the pages were printed with um, the gold metallic ink um, so that they can glow as you bend and turn the pages. And so you know, the book is sort of glowing from the inside. And so it relates very much to these ideas that I'm talking about. So although this work relates to pain and uncertainty, I also see it as a metaphor for hope. And it speaks to the necessity of beauty and transcendence in our lives. I see this as relating to our current times, especially considering all that we've been through through these past couple of years. And I have hope for what's ahead. Thank you. Um, so the workshop that I'm teaching is um, Silver and Gold Leafing. Um, and it's four sessions on Mondays, um, starting in March and ending in April. Um, and some of my contact information can be found here as well. Well, thank you, Marcy, for that. Okay, thanks. Uh, if other people don't have questions, I sure have a bunch of them. But, okay. <laughs> uh, but I am not going to step on anybody's toes first. Um, <clears throat> but before we begin the Q&A, I have been asked to ask you a couple of questions so we get to know you a little bit more. Are you ready for the first one? Yeah, I see that you're sitting down. So you're ready? <laughs> yeah. What is your favorite book or movie? Oh. Um, Time's up. On to the next question. <laughs> okay. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Are you a science fiction fan or a romance fan or a thriller fan? Um. No, no. Actually, I've been recently I've been reading books on floriography, which is the Victorian language of flowers and how flowers were used to communicate um, messages between women mostly. Yes. Um, and I find this really interesting because it was a way of kind of sending secret messages mm -hmm. um, where in, in a time when they couldn't be more overt. So I'm Kind of doing some research on that. <laughs> that that's that's kind of a during the gilded age and, uh, oh. and there were a lot of big society parties my uh, my cousin renee rosen has written extensively about that topic and we were actually discussing that a few weeks ago and that sometimes they would place flowers on one wrist or the other and that would sign signify their availability 
at social mm -hmm. gatherings and that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty fascinating. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And do you have a favorite drink to go along with your flowers? Uh, I like rosé wine. <laughs> well, perfect. A flower-based wine. That's perfect. <laughs> and uh, has has uh, there been, is there a part of the world that you'd love to visit that you haven't already? Is there something on your wish list? I'd like to go to Japan. And, and why is that? Uh, I think just the culture and the people, I think all of it could be really interesting. And maybe during the time when the cherry blossoms were in bloom. Well, you, right. you, you have a lot of content there for sure. Right. <laughs> if, you, if you went into photography, would there be something else that would interest you as a profession? Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I have a background in studio art, so I do enjoy kind of painting and drawing and, and some of the more tactile mm -hmm. um, techniques. So, yeah. And last but not least, is there a funny story or something you'd like to share that we wouldn't already know about you? And maybe the thing we talked about the other day? Sure, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know why I was thinking about this, but somehow I was. Um, when I was little, when I was about three or four years old, um, people would ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I didn't really know how to answer that, but I had a children's book uh, that had a section on what you could be when you grow up. So I remember looking through that and um, it just nothing was really striking me. There were pictures of firefighters and doctors and police officers and things. But next to one of the characters, there was a small yellow flower. And I thought that's what that's it. It's it's on the page of what you could be when you grow up. That's so that's what I told everybody. Um, so <laughs> obviously I'm not a flower, but um, there's something about that that I think has kind of stayed with me kind of in the back of my head. And I think it relates to this project or, or what we looked at tonight. You can, yeah, you can see the thread through that. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. So um, thank you for that, Marcy. Um, I do not see any questions in the chat. Um, would anybody, does anybody have anything they'd like to ask Marcy? Any clarification on anything? All just stunned, huh? Okay. <laughs> I'm well, sorry. I think I went through that a little fast and I, I should have slowed down a little. <laughs> well, no, I, I thought the pace was pretty good. Um, okay, we have a question. What kind of vellum do you, are you using on your artwork? Um, I'll use uh, Strathmore or Reich vellum. Um, it's anything that I can run through the, the printer. Um, so you're, that's you're a, putting it through an ink, inkjet printer? Yeah, yeah. So the images are manipulated digitally. Um, and then, yes, they are printed digitally, but then there's this, you know, sort of hands-on process with the gilding afterwards. Does it matter what side you're printing on the vellum? Um, most of the time with the vellum that I'm using, it doesn't, but it, it depends on the, the paper itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I was going to ask this as well. Could you elaborate a little bit more uh, when you're when you're putting the um, the varnish and the wax on? Is that mm -hmm. on the you're putting the varnish and the wax on the side with the gold leaf or the front side? Uh, that's a, a good question. Wax? Yeah, um, actually, I apply it to both. I apply the varnish to both sides. So what it does is it seals and it protects the um, gold leaf on the back because mm -hmm. um, that can scratch or get damaged easily. Um, and then on the front, I use it as a UV protectant as well. Um, and then I'll apply the wax to the front as well to kind of bring out the contrast and you know the tonal values and stuff. And is there is there a it, like, is it beeswax that you melt down or is it something that you take out of a jar and you paint on? How does that work? Um, it's, it's a cold wax. So it's, yeah, it's from a jar <laughs> that I just kind of smooth on the surface afterwards, after the varnish is dried. And the, so the varnish protects the gold leaf from getting scraped off when you put the wax on. Um, the, yeah, the varnish protects the gold leaf, um, but the wax only goes on the front oh. and the gold leaf is on the back so it doesn't necessarily touch the the gold leaf and uh is it a spray varnish or is it 
Is it painted on? Is there a particular brand that you like? <laughs> I tend to. Questions. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I tend to use um, a UV um, archival varnish. So I'm trying to use products that are acid free and that are going to last a long time and as well as you know protect the work. So is it hard to source that. Uh, no, not really. Um, you know, there's the Krylon and Golden make mm. varnishes like that. So yeah. So, you know, I have a question since there's nothing else in the chat, if I can jump in here. Uh, sure. You were referencing a lot of Anna Atkins work and uh -huh. she was using cyanotypes and mm -hmm. in her, her exploration of, of, of flowers and, and that kind of stuff. Have you, are you familiar with Carl Blossfeld's work? Yes, yes. Because and I and I noticed that you didn't reference him though. I'm, I would think that he would be such an inspiration for you with his. I mean, he was very mechanical and meticulous, and I mean, he was using these as botanical studies that look like art and uh, right, extremely detailed. Uh, right. Yeah, I like the way his images look. Um, I think that. Um, I'm not quite in alignment with the ideas on why he made them. So that's why I sort of left them out. But I do, but I, see, you know, visually, I think that they, um, they're gorgeous. And I, I do right. take inspiration from them in that sense. Well, and, and I understand why there's not a lot of inspiration for you there, because his was more of a scientific study of documentation, but they have this other, for me, I see them as art first and documentation second so for me i find yeah. it incredibly inspiring but if the folks yeah. if you haven't seen carl blossfeld's work you should look him up uh b-l-o-s-s-f-e-l-d i think is and if he i think he did the work in the 1920s if, like almost a century ago yeah so great yeah. work uh i do not see any other questions in the chat oh you know i had one more if you won't mind would you go over that equation again m equals O over C is that? Yeah, sure. Did you yes. look that up, or was that was that from? No, that was from that was from an article. Oh. Um, yeah, that's um, okay. it's this idea. So M is aesthetic value. Oh, aesthetic. Okay, and that's okay. that's what it equals. Mm -hmm. O is order. That's on the top of the equation, mm -hmm. um, and it complexity. it's over C, which is complexity. Right. Aesthetic equals order over complexity. That yeah. is an interesting. <laughs> it's bringing a scientific approach almost to the creative process. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was from a New York Times Magazine article on how beauty is making scientists rethink evolution. So they're really considering, you know, how all these things may be a part of us um, innately. <laughs> Makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what it was like to make the book that you did? Because that's a very interesting book. And I, was that your idea to do that, that sort of gold on the back page? So it, it kind of reinforced your whole gold leaf thing. Was that your idea? Did, did the publisher come up with that? Um, we knew right away that we wanted to use the gold colored metallic ink, um, but it was as we were putting the book together that we figured out um, how to how to use that binding or to, or to use that particular binding. So I don't think that that binding was part of it initially, um, but it it worked really well with the idea. Um, so yeah. I mean, so that was kind of a joint effort. <laughs> does it give it a kind of transparency when you look at the book and you see that it, it, it kind of, it, it seemed like it would keep you more connected to the artwork. Yeah, yeah. So um, it had to be expensive yeah. though to make, I would imagine. It's not an easy yeah. thing. Yeah, it was, it was published overseas and there were only a few places that would print with this gold metallic ink and do the binding like that. And it, it was a little complicated. Um, and there were delays on the book coming out in part because it was published overseas. Um, but uh, but I think it worked out in the end. Yeah. Uh, were you responsible? So so the 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 photographic prints or the the prints that you made that go on the book, 
at some point those had to be photographed or scanned and somehow digitized was that your responsibility to do that yeah yeah so i i photographed them i can't really scan this work because the um effects of the metallics don't really come out in a scan mm -hmm. um so it yeah it has to be photographed <laughs> And, and were you at all concerned about, I, I know when I publish books, it's always about that color profile that identifies the color of the file. So when it goes to the printing press, it knows what colors it's supposed to use. Did, did you get involved with the color management aspect? Was that, are you uh, conversant in that? Uh, I, it, the graphic designer handled that mostly. Oh, okay. um, we did a series of proofs, printed proofs, because the color wasn't coming out correctly at first. Um, and it, it was a little complicated, but, um, but it worked. Did, yeah. you, did you give up hope at all at any, any point when you were when you seeing the process <laughs> and the color not coming out? Did you have any doubts like, is it going to work? Or do you, you put your trust in the people? <laughs> Um, <laughs> I think the first round of proofs made me a little nervous, but, um, but I, I trusted the people I was working with. <laughs> My skepticism comes from having a three year career as a commercial photographer. So that's, that's, yeah. that's where I'm coming from on that. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, I do have one other question, if you don't mind. Go for it. Uh, uh, why did you pick Yaffe Press as opposed to, did you think about maybe doing it as a blurb book or some other on-demand printing service? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I have a bunch of Yaffe Press books and I really like the books that she was making because they wow. had this kind of unusual character to them, whether um, it was through the binding or through the way they were printed or there, there were unusual folds that were used. Um, there's a book that's actually not even a book at all. It's a series of pieces that sort of come together <laughs> that are printed. Um, so I was, I, I found that attractive. Um, so I think that that was why I wanted to work with her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, the framing of your prints, is that something that you oversee or do you do yourself or did that, does that go out to a framing shop? Um, Shows? I, yeah, uh, some of them go out to a framing shop. Sometimes I will do the framing. Um, it it kind of depends on the show and the, the timeline. <laughs> so, so do you have a yeah. workshop where you can cut the framing material and put it all together? Uh, no, but I live uh, near a place that can provide that pretty quickly. Wow. So, nice. um, so yeah. Well, good. It's nice, it's nice yeah. to have good resources. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Well, I don't know, Brandon, I, I guess we're, we've completed. our. Yeah. Here I'll just, I'll, I'll take it from here. Uh, I want to thank uh, Michael for your time tonight and moderating. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, want to thank all of our guests here this evening for attending. Uh, appreciate that. And Marcy, thank you for your time as well. Really appreciate it. It's great to see you in person. Uh, I should say virtually, <laughs> kind of a person. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have been isolated way too long. Brandon. Yeah, I know. It's this really isn't real, real, Brandon. This, this, this is like, real. It seems like in person to me, right? That's weird. All right. This is uh, the new abnormal. It, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's hard to adjust. But, uh, anyways, thank you all so much. Uh, have a wonderful evening. All right. Thank, thank you all Marcy. so much. I really appreciate it. Your, your work is really beautiful, Marcy. <laughs>